What's happening, everybody? I'm glad that you are here with All Access Live with Kevin Rankin. I've had a little time off dealing with some family stuff, and it's a nice escape to come back with an amazing guest today. Before I get started and talk about her, I want to ask you a favor. If you could do me a favor, go to a link below, go to youtube.com slash at Access Kevin. You're going to find over 300 episodes of past episodes. You can subscribe to this channel. You're definitely going to want to like this video and share it. Um, you can also become a member, and members get exclusive en uh, benefits. Uh, some interviews that are only available to members. I'm also offering some prize packages. So as uh, I'm out on tour this summer with the Flock of Seagulls, I've got uh, ticket packages and swag packs, and um, I'll give you some autographed Flock of Seagulls drumsticks and picks and whatever else I can give you. Um, I've even got, look at these groovy new Kevy metal stickers that somebody just put together. So, um, so become a member and you'll get a bunch of benefits, but, uh, I would love it if you just subscribe. And also there's an amazing guitar shop that has helped me out from the beginning. Five Star Guitars is based in Beaverton, Oregon. And that means that if you order online, there's no sales tax. So a lot of you guys are outside the Oregon area. You're paying a ton of dough and you're going to guitar shops and you're having a, you don't get the benefit of supporting a local business that charges no sales tax. And if you use the link below, go to you, uh, fivestarguitars.com slash all access live. There's a promo code that you can see at the bottom. Use that one, all access 15. You're going to save 15% off everything you see there too. So lots of great deals. They've been wonderful to us. And uh, and so thanks, Five Star. Let them know I sent you. They also do repairs. They do lessons and, um, and all sorts of great stuff. They've got accessories. So uh, online lessons, if you're outside the area, you can get lessons from pros like Jennifer Batten. So you're going to want to do that because my next guest is an incredible instrumentalist. She plays so many instruments, uh, one of which she's got in her hand right now. And I think while we had the countdown theme song, she was learning the theme on her cigar box guitar. So bringing all the way, <laughs> all the way back uh, in Portland again. I got my win. How you doing, sister? I'm doing really good. It's so good to see you. How are you? I miss you, man. I, uh, I've been tracking, tracking you since the last time we got to chat. And um, man, it seems like the world has changed a lot, you know, since then. But I know. I, I feel like I've changed a lot since then too, you know, like I feel like a whole different person since the last time we talked. <laughs> yeah. Well, how's, how much so? What, tell me, I mean, besides you mentioned being scatterbrained, which I'm certainly there with you right now. Like uh, what's, uh, what's been happening in the last couple of years? Yeah. I, um, well, I've moved, I recently moved to California. Um, I'm actually oh. back in Oregon right now. I'm visiting um, and okay. doing some work, but um yeah, in addition to that, just like lots of life changes, uh, uh, lots of growth, I think, personal growth. Um, I just like, I've been traveling a lot more on my own, which has been really good for me, I think, good for my brain. <laughs> I feel like I've grown yeah. a lot, you know, but yeah, I think it's just been, it's been a good, good couple of years for personal growth for me. California, I'm, wow, that's a, that's a big change, right? You, uh, cause you, you were in Montana for a little while and, mm -hmm. uh, um, Oregon has been a home for quite some time. Do you mind me asking what kind of region in California? You, uh, the store no, that's not. Your, uh... it's, it's near San Francisco. Um, okay. It's like 40 minutes from San Francisco. It's really close to the beach, uh, close to the Redwoods. It's a really beautiful area. Um, I'm actually like, I'm, I'm mooching off of my parents at the moment. They have a house there uh, temporarily and it's empty. So I was like, I'm going to oh, take advantage yeah. of this situation and, and go go live there. Um, but it's been really nice. It's been a good change. As you know, like Oregon is yeah. very cloudy. So I've been enjoying the California sun a lot. <laughs> you know what? Actually, yeah. Since I talked to you last, I had moved to Santa Fe for almost a year and yeah. I was drawn, drawn to the sun. I, uh, I, you know, they have 320 days of sun there. And so I, um, I was drawn, but I'm back in, in Oregon again as well. So it just keeps pulling me um, back. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Uh, and you just spent some time in Toronto. You've been up there doing some recording, right? Yeah, Toronto yeah. was great. Very cold, but it's always, they always bring me to Toronto when it's like freezing cold and it's snowing. And <laughs> that's, <laughs> but I mean, we're spending test, most of the test, time in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> that's to test your moxie to see if you can pull it off. But, yes. but you know, you're in Montana, you know, cold winters, right? So. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Montana definitely gets really cold and I feel like I've, I've just 
softened just like a few months in California and I've, I've forgotten how to endure the cold. <laughs> yeah. Well, you came back in Oregon at a good time I and mean, it's fairly sunny outside and yeah. I, in, in, uh, in Montana for the last two months, just came back day before yesterday for, um, you know, and I came back just in time for a little rain, a little sun, but it's, it, um, to me, you know, when I got familiar with your music, um, our mutual friend, Rob McLean was the one that connected us at first. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, I always felt like your music felt Portland to me, you know, there's a, yeah. there's a smile, right. And, and so whether you're in California or you're in Toronto, I think you've always got that kind of thing going on, but yeah, I take that as a compliment. There's so there's such amazing music yeah. that comes out of the Portland area, and I just know so many incredible, talented artists. So I definitely take that as a compliment. No, you should. I just found <laughs> this is nuts. And if you and I were to look at our mutual friend list, you know, if we went through social media and we looked at the mutuals, I think it would be ridiculous how many overlaps. Probably, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I found video of you in glasses with you and Gil a season. You know, <laughs> oh my god. Gil, it, it, guys, if you, he's mm. incredible. If you guys are watching this and you are not hip to this guy, I'm telling you, he is the most cerebral, brilliant musician I've ever met on this planet. The stuff that he programs is, it, it, it it's astounding to me. But I love it's that incredible. you guys to like, work together. No, and I've taken so much inspiration. Like when I first did that collaboration with him, I had just started to kind of do more um multitasking in my live performances like i'll do foot percussion and keys or and i just started to do like a drum pad and keys while i was doing foot percussion but like the amount of multitasking he can do is just insane like if you watch his yeah. videos he has to have two brains i don't know how he does right. it <laughs> I, and you can tell that he's stretched himself too because he reinvents his sort of direction it seems like every six months. Um, and I know this is about you, this, this show, but, but the fact no, that you guys work together, I, I loved it. Yeah. I, uh, the um, guys, I, first I want to thank uh, uh, Aisa and uh, uh, Ross Quinzer. I see you guys here in the chat too. So thank you guys for being here and being uh, participatory. Um, if you guys are watching this and you're not hip to them, um, go to YouTube and just look up G L A S Y S glasses. Uh, that's mm -hmm. his moniker online. It's yeah, gonna and we, have, you. we have two collaborations out together. Uh, one on his channel, we did um, a cover of "Ballad of the Windfish" from Zelda, um, and uh, that just it was really gorgeous, beautiful piece that we put together. He did like ninety percent of the work. I just did some pretty ooze over the top of it and some like uh. ukulele. Um, and then we did a, co a cover of "People Are People," um, Depeche Mode, and the Depeche. Oh. Yeah, and that's on my channel, and it turned out so cool. And like the layers that he's adding into it, the the percussion, and like it just it turned out really cool. So definitely go check those out. Uh, definitely, yeah. I, the uh, yeah, Ian Bennett, who by the way, it's his birthday today. So Ian, glad you're here as well, and happy birthday. Uh, happy he birthday. says he loves that one. <laughs> oh, thank you. you. Um, I, um, one really fun connection that uh, I discovered since you and I had um, a conversation on the show before, um, Greg Ross owns uh, Manic mm -hmm. Merchandise. And Greg also does work with Envy of One. I think they distribute a bunch of merchandise for Envy of One. Greg's this incredible bass player up in uh, upstate New York. And I don't know how much time you guys have had connected, but when I told him that I was going to have you back on the show, you know, people melt when I talk about you and your performances <laughs> and you, um, and I'll just give you a couple examples. Like, so Greg is another one. He, he knows how talented you are. Of course, your connection with Andy and Alex, you know, with envy of none is, is special to him. I was in Montana talking to the uh, publisher for this newspaper. And, um, as we talked about her publication, I see the cigar box guitar up in the corner of the room and she had a three string cigar box that she got that was beautifully crafted from this craftsman in, in rural Montana. And, uh, I pointed it out. My mom saw it. She said, Oh, that's interesting. What, you know, what's that all about? And I said, wait, before she tells you the story, let me show you what it's all about. And I brought up your little clip where you just, you know, you describe 
how much you love to introduce people to instruments. And you went through the little um, sort of progression of different treatments of that guitar, you know, adding effects and reverb. And I'm no mean to put you on the spot, but it was so well done. And I keep seeing, because I've shown that clip to about a dozen different people, Aww. the woman <laughs> from the, the newspaper, it blew her mind because she's had it sitting on the wall since she got it last summer. And she said, I had no clue that I could do that with this guitar. I thought it was just like decorative. So <laughs> you, want, you want to give people a little idea of what uh, what can happen with, oh my God, look at that gorgeous guitar too. That's so yeah. pretty. Tell me about this. Tell me about this one and where, where this one came from. Yeah, so this is my other design. In that video you're talking about, I have two designs that I did um, for this custom cigar box guitar. Um, you can get these. I think you can start the pre-orders now. We're going to be launching them around the same time as my album. I think a few people have like gotten them early. Um, so if okay. you really want one now, you could probably reach out to Lace and, and get them to send you an early one. But um, there's this one with the skull with butterfly wings and then i have another design that i did um this one i had help from my friend toria from Dreadlight um in designing this one and she did these awesome wings and the skull and i kind of made the skull a little bit more angry um yes. <laughs> she did most of the work on this one and then i did a, a painting because, of it because you're so hardcore is that why yeah because you're <laughs> yeah. so angry <laughs> yes <laughs> i need okay. to get angrier um but I did this other painting with a tree and a skeleton and a little butterflies. Um, so there's two designs and they're both these beautiful cigar box guitars that Lace Pickups makes. And I'm very excited about having my own custom instruments. Um, I don't have my distortion pedal with me right now, but I do have this cigar box. So you're gonna hear it just through my, my speaker. Um, I'm gonna do something a little bit softer. I'm assuming you wanted me to play a song. <laughs> I'm, I'm begging you to play the song, but what I do okay. want to do is thank you. I'm, I appreciate the fact that you actually made it color coded, uh, you know, in, in alignment with my color scheme for All Access Live. You know, the purple yeah. is so. Thank you for doing that. Just, You're just for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, this is um, next to mine, and it's a, a song that I wrote on this. It's one of the first songs that I wrote on the cigar box guitar once I got it. Um, so it'll be nice to be able to play this for you. Thank you. Are you hearing that? Do you look up at the sky? Are you watching same satellites? When you see the world above, do you feel the same warmth of love? Do you think of us when the sun comes up? And it's a simple thing to want you in my arms, but I'm a lifetime away from having you. But you feel so far from me tonight. <laughs> when you wander those old streets, I wonder if think of you. When you're home alone at night. Do I cross your like you do? It's a simple thing to want you in my arms, but I'm a lifetime away from having you. 
Te fiança forte. I don't know if you can hear that very well at all. I, I, yeah, I could hear your voice really well. Sometimes the guitar got a little quiet, but it uh, yeah. it's so it's so warm. Oh my it god! Is, it's like so yeah. Beautiful. Oh, that uh, um, can I see the side of that? Actually, that that um, that's got some nice ornate detail there too. Look at that. That is beautiful. Yeah. And for the and official some lace pickups, we're gonna, like, we're gonna do maybe some purple tape around the side too, so we'll get some color scheme going on with this oh, but this yeah. is the prototype it's part of why i was messing up a little bit because the prototype i so here's the full story they had these cigar box guitars they sent me one or i guess i had one already and they um we were designing my version and they had the volume knob on the top and oh. they have a bunch of female artists but I guess I was the first one who was bold enough to bring it up. But for women, that was, a for me, it was a problem. And for a lot of the other yeah. women, it's a problem. Because, you know, where the guitar yeah, is. Yeah, it's a bad location. It's a bad location. And when you're playing, you know, your chest was sort of like changing the volume as, oh, as you're playing. So wow. for a lot of women, it was a problem. So they changed it for me, which is very sweet. So my version yeah, is I mean, better, better for the ladies. <laughs> It's it's an interesting gimmick that if you did pull that off, you know, then uh, yeah, you know, you know <laughs> nice party <laughs> trick in the middle of the song. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I um, uh, I was, you know, one thing I didn't really know about is why they chose a cigar box as sort of the fundamental foundation, you know, for an instrument. I think, I mean, because. I've seen milk jug basses, you'd write or jug basses and, and some of that kind of stuff, but you've, you've played a bunch of different styles. Uh, I mean, a bunch of, uh, of unique instruments, you know, so like, um, there was the, an instrument that you played and I, and I used that promotional, the graphic that I used to promote this event. You had this beautiful long necked instrument and I, you even told me what that was when we talked before and I forgot. So what oh, is that? Long neck. Does it, does it have a lot of strings? Yes. Or is it like long and skinny? Yep. Nope. Long, a lot of strings. A lot of strings. Um, it's probably the harp guitar. The harp guitar. Okay. Yeah. It makes sense. Actually, that would be like, um, yeah. it looks kind of like a harp, a harp shape. But uh, yeah. Um, I think you mentioned at one point or in that viral clip, you played like 16 instruments. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I and, play a lot so of when instruments. You, and ukulele was one that you talk about playing. You introduce people to because there are few, fewer strings, like cigar box. So it's a, mm -hmm. maybe an easier sort of transition to get into stringed instruments. Definitely. Uh, but fewer frets, right? And the ukulele too. So you've got you know an opportunity to learn a few chords and be able to learn to play mm -hmm. and sing at the same time. But but like a harp guitar has got a ton of strings. And so did you start off playing harp as a youngster or like <laughs> how did you... Uh, or did you just want to challenge yourself with getting uh, more familiar with? I strings? just I have an obsession with weird instruments, and as soon as I saw like a harp guitar for the first time, I was like, I I just I need to I need to learn that I need to have one I need to play it. <laughs> and if you play, you start playing enough instruments, and you realize most stringed instruments are kind of related. I think people who play a lot of horns, it's kind of the same thing, you know. Like oh, yeah. if you play a lot of woodwinds or or horns, you can kind of like learn a lot of instruments in the same family and for me i just i know a lot of stringed instruments so like having grown up i i first learned to play um the piano which kind of gave me a really good just general understanding of of chord progressions and and a little bit of, of music theory knowledge and and um i just feel like it's such an easy beginner instrument because it's such a linear layout of of notes you know you start at the lowest note and you go to the highest note and then it's everything between with a guitar it's a little bit more complicated um navigating the fretboard like logically um sure. but with stringed instruments once you start to get to know one it's much easier to learn another one like a ukulele if you know the guitar you can play the ukulele because um you're using a lot of the same uh chord patterns with your hands um sure it's just two less strings and it's a different key 
but um, same with the banjo and the mandolin, um, you start to recognize similar patterns and, and it's the same kind of style of playing. You're doing the same things with your hands. So um, it was pretty easy for me to start picking up more and more instruments. And the more that I did it, the easier it got. And so like, you know, now I have a saz and a bazooki and all these weird instruments, the harp guitar and, and um, I've got hammered dulcimers and mountain dulcimers and Merlin wow. dulcimers. And like, it's just, it's wow. so fun. And um, I think once you start to learn a few in instruments in that sort of stringed instruments family, you can pick up most of them pretty quickly and it becomes really addictive and fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, you know, uh, drummers kind of do the same, right? I mean, it, as, mm -hmm. as a drum set player, you know, I like to collect percussion instruments and it's nice to be able to have some variation. When I first, I think it was developing any kind of proficiency at all, um, taking classes and, and in school, you know, teachers were trying to force certain fundamentals and they'd want you to learn, you know, snare technique and you'd get those traditional the rudiments down. And then they want you, you know, if you go on to college and you're studying, they want you to learn mallet instruments. So you've got an understanding of all the keys and you're playing two and four mallet instruments. And all I really wanted to do was rock. I just, want, I just wanted to play drums. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just like, to me, I, I felt, I, I guess maybe a little bit more of a primitive, primitive, you know, physical connection to being able to hit things harder. And, um, and I felt a bigger connection, I think, musically when I get into an ensemble and uh, playing drums, you know, it was such a physical thing, but there was so much listening involved. And so the instruments that you're talking about playing, um, certain instruments you're playing are wonderful for ensembles. I would imagine some of them are solo instrumental, instrumental sort of focused, but yeah. I mean, you've got a lot of stuff going on. I mean, we'll talk envy of one <laughs> for sure, but you've got a gig here in town tomorrow, right? I Is do. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm playing, yeah. um, at the Hawthorne. Um, I think now I'm going to mess it up. I've, this is how scatterbrained I am. I'm doing, the craziest amount of stuff right now. Um, and there's just so much going on, but yes, I have a show tomorrow. I'm going to look it up to make sure I get it right, but I'm opening for Dreadlight for their album release show. Um, and I'm going to be collaborating with them. And I will have uh, a few songs that we're, we'll do together. We've done a lot of collaborations on YouTube. We, I don't know if you're familiar with the Hex Girls, but um, no. it's a band in Scooby-Doo. <laughs> and okay. uh, like for a lot of people in in my generation it was like they were the coolest cartoon band out there <laughs> so yeah oh uh, okay yeah so dreadlight and i have done a couple of covers of those songs dressed up as those characters and um so really and those videos, yeah and those videos have done pretty well on, on youtube and stuff and i think our cover of hex girl just passed a million streams on spotify um oh God. yeah which is it's really exciting dollars right yeah, uh, yeah. So it's just really streams. fun. Sorry, oh, what did you say? Well, first, um, I was going to say a million streams gets you like what four dollars worth of uh, royalties. Yeah, yeah. Stream, <laughs> stream revenue. Yeah, uh, like two dollars and and some exposure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the exposure is definitely where you're at, especially if you're promoting <laughs> gigs. Which, by the way, the gig apparently is at Hollow Scene. Um, that's what. Thank uh, Ross, you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ross. <laughs> Appreciate that. But. Um, uh, um, you guys are headlining, I'm sure. And yeah, or, or yeah, yeah. Dreadlight's headlining. I'm supporting them. They're some of my closest friends, so I'm super happy to be supporting them. And and um and we'll be playing some songs together. Uh, but they're amazing. They've worked so hard on this album, and it's just a really, really amazing album. And um, on top of that, they're, they've put together this amazing release show uh, that has like a party afterwards there's going to be snacks they have like a little red carpet with the backdrop for photos um and they even figured out how to get guitar hero set up so after the show oh, it's like open yeah. guitar hero for anybody oh, that can play God. so it's going to be really great and just a fun you know hang out for anybody who comes so please come <laughs> you had me at snacks and guitar hero there you go yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? um, ross leave some snacks for me all right the uh yeah <laughs> Uh, that, uh, all right. So you've got that going on. You're playing the hex girls, like sort of, uh, dedication, uh, and open up yeah. the red light, red light. Um, 
uh, you've got your solo stuff. Now, last you and I were talking in mm-hmm. between and being none stuff, you were bumping around doing a lot of solo shows. Are you still doing yeah. a lot of those as well? Okay. Yes. Yes. And I am actually, I haven't officially like announced it yet, but I just booked, um, I'm opening for Pratik Kohat on a five, six week tour starting at the end of the month. So I'm about to announce all of the dates I'm opening and I'm the only musician that's supporting him as a backing musician. I'll be doing keys and guitar and and vocals, uh, backing vocals for him. Um, but he's incredible. If you haven't heard his music, it's like singer songwriter, um, just, gorgeous voice um i think co2 is probably one of my favorite songs of his and um i've just been i've been having so much fun learning the music um and i'm just so excited to be opening it'll be my first time on the road like in a real tour bus um which i'm I'm very excited about not being cramped in a tiny van with like way too much gear and a dog and like (laughs) 12 people uh, like a little town car it'll be really nice real real bus i don't know if you would agree but i've heard that like sleeping on a tour bus is sort of like sleeping in a coffin so i'm excited to know what that feels like oh that's well that intrigues you that's good to know the, yeah. um yeah it depends on how many men you're sharing a bus with because uh <laughs> uh you know as you know i mean traveling in a smaller rig uh it can get cramped yeah. gets smelly it gets smelly a lot of my friends that have van life you know they, they're like yeah i didn't realize how smelly a van could get no matter how hygienically sound you are you know but uh yeah uh, yeah no it, it, tour bus stuff is great though i mean if you really love the you know, um there's it's nice to not have to like load into a hotel load out or load into somebody's couch you know or you know depending on the level of the tours uh, it's nice to be able to just pile on and you wake up and you're in the next town. That's really, really cool. Yeah. You know, to have yeah. somebody else drive and yeah. Yeah. Uh, five weeks. You had a five week tour. Weeks. Yeah. We're starting um, in Atlanta on the 25th of this month. And then we end this leg uh, on June 1st in New York city, which I'm very excited about, but it's all across uh, North America. So uh, we'll be in the States and then we'll be in Canada for I think five or six shows. Um, oh. So I'm very excited. It's a big tour for me. Um, and it'll, yeah, like I said, kind of the first time I'll be um, in a, in the big bus and I'm oh. really excited about it. <laughs> Not your last. Not your last. I, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, guess who's here from Minneapolis in the chat? There's Rob McLean. Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> Hey, Rob. <laughs> Rob, who paired us together. Um, Rob and I had a great long talk as I was driving back from, from Montana and you know, you should know, like Rob and I did a lot of those small tours that you were talking about with the smaller rigs all yeah. around Montana, Idaho, like Wyoming. And, and, uh, yeah, those vans were smelly. I'm just telling you <laughs> they're, they're, those, those band houses that we were in were not at all appropriate for, you know, petite, uh, musicians with fairy wings. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, incredible musician, Rob. I, I don't know how you ever got to play with him, but he's an incredible bass player I and a great him. singer and, and even more just like a remarkable human. So, yeah, you know what? I think, you know, this sort of ties into the conversation about these different artists, you know, um, because everything I read about when Envy of None started up and I believe you mentioned Alex discovered you is Andy that uh, connected you to, right? Andy said, mm-hmm. you got to hear this girl. He found you on YouTube. Is it, is that right? Sort of. Yeah. Andy, Andy found me, um, through a contest that I won. He, I won a zoom mentorship call with him and he and I started working on some music together and then, and then, yeah, he showed it to Alex and, and was like, you got to hear this music I've been working on. And um, and yeah, Alex just really, really loved the music and he, and he loved my voice and, and really wanted to, to add some guitars to what we were doing. The, um, again, folks, if you're watching this and you're hip to envy of none and maybe Maya's solo stuff and you don't know Andy Curran's name, Andy is old school Coney Hatch guy. I mean, mm-hmm. so as, as far as Canadian rock and rollers goes, he's royalty as well, you know? And mm-hmm. um, it's funny, we've been sort of friends and acquainted on Facebook, never met in person, tons of mutual friends. Everybody mm-hmm. that I play with up there, it's from Toronto, all, you know, they go way back with Andy. And mm-hmm. from what I've heard too, I mean, he, like you, has a really just warm connection to people 
you know, and there's a sincerity and an authenticity to his personality. And I think it's really strange, right, in this business. I mean, there's there are nefarious characters, right? And we all deal the business is full of sketchy people. And it could jade you and really intimidate you and make you not want to relate to people at all. But um, when I first talked to Rob about you and heard your music and, and Rob was like, oh yeah, you got to meet Maya. She's, she's amazing. Um, uh, you read Andy about, you know, Andy's sort of review of you and Alex, the same thing. They discovered that warmth and that sincerity that most people might be hesitant to even take a shot on you. So props to Andy, first of all, for, you know, for connecting you. But I love to read Alex and his response to having discovered, you know, how brilliant you really are. Mm. So tell me about the first time you guys sat down and just tried to collaborate and put music together. Yeah, uh, man, like you said, they've just been such, such kind people. Um, it's funny that you said that about Andy, you know, being connected to everybody because he really is like, yeah, he knows everybody and if you need something, ask Andy and, and, you know, he'll find a way to get it for you. Like we were looking for a location, like the most random location for a, a music video we were filming. And, and, uh, we're like, let's, let's ask Andy. Andy will know where we can find a gross bathroom that we can film in or, Ooh. you know, a, a car junkyard. And, and he's got connections to everybody and everything. And, and everybody loves Wait, him. Can I his. Can I, can I use that sound bite? Just so Andy knows exactly where to find the gross bathroom for the music video. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So, he does. He, all does. Right. he does everything. <laughs> you need anything, and just ask Andy. <laughs> but yes, right. uh, <laughs> yes, please do. Um, <laughs> yeah, but no, he's been super kind and, and just such a gentleman and just so wonderful to work with. And he has been a great m mentor for me. Um, and just this, this last week when I was in Toronto, it was just so, so wonderful to reconnect with the guys because I just, I love being around them and they've, you know, it's it's been a difficult few years for me, especially. And so I think having them and having their support in this industry and like helping guide me through that and, and just knowing that they're there for me has been a big, a big thing for me um, to know that I can lean on them and, and have their support. Yeah. And, um, it's just been really wonderful. And honestly, when we get to hang out in person, it's just been like laughter and tears and, and just really genuine conversations over dinner. And, um, you know, they call themselves my Canadian brothers and, and that's what it feels like. It's just, you know, and Alf, Alf as well. He's just such a kind, wonderful, talented human being. So those guys are just, they're, you know, they're my Canadian brothers and I just, I love having them in my life. Um, but they've just, they've championed me and they've supported me and, and getting to work with them and get to know them as people beyond the music has just been such, such a joy. So I feel very fortunate. Yeah. I mean, you, t you talked about the difficult couple of years and, and I don't want to pry. We haven't talked about any of that. Um, I think when we did have our first chat on the show, this, this program was kind of born out of a challenge, right? I mean, it really, the, the Alexis live thing came from this break where my whole life had sort of surrounded, been surrounded by family and music, right? And when the pandemic happened and everything that related to traveling and playing music and interacting with people, I so yearn for connection with people when that went away. I had to find some way to sort of replace that with this. And we talked about identity loss and crisis because as musicians and artists, you know, we, I, what we do is kind of who we are seeing. That's how, who we are. Right. And what we do was taken away. So what we are became sort of insignificant in some, in some respects, a lot of people in the show talked about how they had a whole crisis identity crisis where they had to rediscover themselves. Um, and I also felt the pain from a lot of those people on the show and it, it really took a toll on me big time. Like I, I, uh, I went through massive amounts of depression because I was feeling everybody else's identity crisis and 
had to do a lot of soul searching. So that's my own disclosure that it was a heavy time for me. And um, yeah. I don't know if any that relates to you, but is there stuff that you can talk about that maybe um, you've been able to process through like your Canadian brothers and music? Yeah. yeah, I definitely relate to the identity searching and trying to figure out who I am beyond the music. I think um, I was so focused on music for a very long time as a source of distraction almost from a lot of stuff that I was going through. Um, and recently I've kind of come away from a very dark place and, and, you know, moving away from Oregon ultimately was a really good thing for me. Um, so I was getting away from a lot of really negative things in my past, uh, that I had been stuck in for too long. And, um, yeah. and immediately after that, I kind of went through a pretty severe identity crisis where I was like, who am I beyond the music and beyond yeah. this dream? Because I was so focused on it and i realized it was almost a coping mechanism you know to to avoid what i was dealing with and then once i started dealing with stuff i realized i have no identity outside of this thing i don't know who i am i don't know and that's you know also a product of like leaving a really bad situation with relationships that were really toxic and like i didn't have a sense of self outside of that and like i went through a huge identity crisis um trying to just figure out who am I, what, what do I want and, and what do I like and what makes me happy and, and um, where do I want to go with this journey in, in music and, and why do I want to make music? And, and there was, there's been a lot, a lot of, um, of soul searching in the last year. And, um, and I think I've finally reconciled so much of that inside of myself and, and I'm feeling so much more independent and, grounded in my sense of self um even just beyond the music which i think ultimately has led to a healthier relationship with music and and the career that i'm trying to to create um because i think if you if you make your career and your your art everything um it's it leaves you in kind of a precarious place with your mental health you know if everything's riding yeah. on everything um going well and then you have things like the pandemic that can just change everything in an instant and uh, you have to be really solid in who you are and, and and what you want and what makes you happy outside of that because you never know how things might change in the future um it's a it's a crazy career path as you know it's it's inconsistent even for the best of people who who are successful you know there's there's waves where things are really great and then you crash on the other end and you you feel that low point after a high point and you're not sure if you'll get back to that high again or or where you're going afterwards it's so unpredictable and so hard to maintain any sense of consistency in this career so oh. yeah i don't know i definitely relate oh. to all of that <laughs> Man, um, you know, you talked about coming to grips with some of this stuff, especially right after you moved. Um, mm -hmm. My son, Caleb, is a huge Maya Wynn fan. Uh, he was chatting in the last time that we, you know, yeah. we, we were <laughs> going through this because, um, well, for a bunch of different reasons. I mean, he's a multi-instrumentalist. He's a wonderful drummer, uh, much better drummer than I. And he's a massive, when I say massive, and you know the type because you've been, you've been, uh, consumed by those people in some respects he's a massive rush fan right tattooed <laughs> over all over the place and uh and neil peart was god to him right yeah. uh he he could tell you everything that you could possibly discover about getty and alex and neil and uh, it's really sweet to see people you know embrace you it's hard to see people that are so opinionated about the rush thing that they wouldn't even give envy and un a chance they, they wouldn't yeah. even you know like people people wouldn't even listen to those comments because the first time i saw the comment from alex saying i've never found somebody so inspiring as a musician and you know before i mean that wasn't i'm paraphrasing but he said he's been most influenced by your muse right and I, I saw, you know, some comments of people saying, oh my God, how could that even be? Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, and, and that's not dissing any relationship that Alex had with Ed, Gally, Getty or, no. or Neil. I mean, if anybody would sort of face that sort of identity sort of challenge, it might be somebody like Getty or Alex, right? Who 
their whole life was defined by Rush. And then when Rush is no more, you get to you either get to pivot, right? And you discover new ways to express yourself and hope that people embrace that. But as artists, man, it's throwing, you know, the cards up in the air and seeing if they actually land somewhere because um you they had such a loyal fan base. But yeah. it's also fickle, right? Because if you're really a loyal fan of Alex or Getty or Neil, you're going to want to support their efforts, you know? What do they want just Alex to just start playing tribute gigs to his own music, you know, in the past. I mean, of course not. And yeah. I was, I, I think, um, I love the fact that the people that are really embracing the music, whether they were fans of Rush or not, uh, recognize it for what it is. It's completely different. It and, is. It's very different. And and I think when he said that too, it wasn't to say that it's like working with me is is more somehow better or or. Better you know, right. more inspiring, but I think because of the way that we work, it's been completely different for him. And, yeah. and I think nothing will ever touch the inspiration and the experience that, that was rushed. You know, I could never touch that. Um, sure. And couldn't, it's not, it's like comparing apples to oranges, you know, and it's just completely different experience. Um, yeah. But I think the way that we've worked together and we've talked about it a lot he and I are very similar when it comes to creating sonic space and harm and like harmonies and textures. But you know, his instrument is the guitar, and with this project, my instrument is my voice. And the way that I layer my vocals, and the way that he layers textures with his guitar, it's it's a very similar um, thing. And we often are riffing off of each other, and it's like this dance between the vocals and the guitars and i think emotionally we really connect with each other as well um and i think that's just trying to express that is is where he was coming from and and yeah. um and we've tried to express that to people in different ways because it, it really does there's this kinship that we have um you know and, and this similarity in the approach that we have and and we don't work in the same space together you know it's all been digital it's all been virtual really? sending files back and forth i work in my own yeah. space he works in his own space and we both prefer that because we get the headspace to just be in our own space focused on our own parts and you know there's no distractions i've done some stuff in the studio but we, we were just talking about this uh, at dinner the other night that we both prefer being in our own studio space because it, it it's such a um it's so much better for just being able to focus and um create the art that, that you want to make you know and and in the studio there's lots of distractions sometimes too many ideas floating around and so much pressure to to perform perfectly you know and and um and i recorded a lot of vocals but none of them felt quite right at the end of the day because it's the emotion that wasn't there and mm -hmm. he and i were, were talking about this like even though technically yes this is on pitch yes i'm hitting all the notes and yes um but it's not quite right and it didn't feel right and i was feeling that at the end of the day and i was feeling really bummed out about it because i was like oh and i know i'm a perfectionist as as most musicians are with our own parts but i, I felt so relieved when he had said the same thing that like there's just something that's not quite there um and i just felt this huge sense of relief because he and i are so often on the same page and yeah. and then we were like you know it's it's the space it's 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 the pressure of working in this sort of like you're in a pressure cooker you know and you you have to like get everything done in a certain amount of time everybody's watching you you're literally in a little glass box and everybody's looking at you and waiting for you to like do the things and some people thrive in those environments and like can really nail it but like that's just not the kind of artist that i am it's not the kind of vocalist that i am and i really like i love being able to craft harmonies and textures and layers and when i'm writing trying out different things and different styles of performance and nuance to the emotion behind each phrase and like i will take so much time to get it exactly how i want it to be you know and it's just so hard to replicate that in like a bigger studio setting so we like figured out how to get me some better gear so that i can match the quality more closely to what we were getting in the studio but so that i can take it home 
be in my own little bubble and get it perfect for this next record. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was actually, yeah, I was going to ask about the ways that, you know, you bring stuff together because there are, you know, a vast majority of bands these days do things virtually, right? They're not all going into a studio and saying, today we're going to sit down, we're going to write some songs together, record them, and and what comes out is going to be the final product. Um, people live in different places. The pandemic did help. A lot of people realized that you could do things remotely, but you guys are on opposite coasts of the, you know, the continent, right? And so mm -hmm. um, I would imagine that leading up to that, you mentioned having some gear that was um, compatible um, back home. Do you throw, you know, this process is always unique and different. And I'm maybe asking this for people that don't understand the the traditional sort of process and and songwriting, especially in a group. Um, do you maybe come up and and say, "Hey, Andy, Alf, Alex, um, I got this melody that's just rattling around my head. This is kind of what I'm putting together." And you throw that out their way and see what they come up with, or what is what's a standard way that you guys kind of um, collaborate to write your music together? Yeah, so it's actually it usually starts with Andy and Alf. Um, Alf and Andy will sort of create these instrumental ideas. Um, I I love what they do. It's like the instrumentals that they come up with are so cool. Um, and and they have like a whole folder of these um, that they've sent my way for for both albums now. And it's like here's a bunch of ideas, and some of them are not fully you know fleshed out. It's like here's a minute long instrumental, and it's got bass and synths and temp drums and some cool textures and Andy's usually putting his bass through you know distortion pedals and doubling it to get a really meaty tone for some of these and and there's lots of different some of them are really quirky and weird and and a lot of times we gravitate towards the weird ones and um, yeah. or the really dark and menacing ones or there's certain ones that I'll, I'll start listening to and think oh you know yeah I'm feeling this one a lot um and this, the first album was very eclectic for that same reason. And there was a few songs that were Alex's instrumentals that we started with, um, but most of them were Andy and Alf's. And then there was okay. uh, one song, Old Strings, that started out as my song that I had completely written and I had demoed out and sent to them. And then they kind of stripped apart the instrumental from the vocal and then added a different instrumental to it. And it turned out just beautiful. Um, so uh, it's... It's kind of different depending on the song, but for the most part, it starts with Andy and Alf, and then they'll send it to me, um, usually, and I will kind of, sometimes I'll restructure it if I'm like, oh, this feels more like a chorus, let me put this here, and then put this verse here, and and then I'll write lyrics and vocal melodies and harmonies and, and basically take this bit and make it a full song with vocal ly like lyrics and, and melodies and harmonies. And then Alex will add textures on top of that. Uh, but sometimes they'll send it and Alex will add textures first. And then I will do that same process. Um, and there are times where, where Andy will have like a, a chorus idea uh, vocally and, and it'll have his temp vocals. And I will write verses to go along with the the chorus that he has or he'll just have like one or two words like a little hook um and i will write everything around that or it's just completely instrumental and i'll i'll come up with whatever comes up to my head like we have a a song on this new record that started out um oh my gosh my phone is at one percent battery one second <laughs> it's gonna die. yeah you plug it in hey while you plug it in i'll, I'll let people know I mean, i'll give them the little pitch here all right guys so hey um really quick if you came here late, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go to this channel. Go right here. Go to youtube.com slash at Access Kevin. Uh, you can subscribe to the channel. I want you to make sure that you like this video and then share it with your peeps. Um, at the end of this episode, I'm going to make sure that uh, there's a little card to connect this video with um, the previous interview that we did. Uh, lots happened with Maya the last couple of years since that one was put together. and. Um, I'm going to hide her screen for a second while she's uh, plugging in. Um, so that channel or uh, that, uh, that video will be connected to this one. Um, also 
the uh, I would love it right now if you could me do me a favor. Uh, check out the uh, five star guitars dot com slash all access live. These guys have been supportive of the channel. There's a discount that you get using all access 15 as a promo code for all the products you see there. And, uh, you know, if you're outside the Portland, Oregon area, outside of Oregon, and you want to play guitar, um, go to that link below and, uh, they, everything you buy there, there's no sales tax. So you can save a ton of money. <clears throat> Let me also say coming up tomorrow, if you subscribe to the channel, you'll hit the little bell. You'll be notified of the upcoming episodes. Um, I've got an incredible guitarist. You, if you're a hairband guy, you probably know um, Mark Ferrari from the band Keel. Uh, he's also got a band Cold Sweat. Um, you would know him from the hairband rock days off of Headbangers Ball, but he's done so much since then. So uh, he's a, a, a phenomenal children's book writer. He started a program years ago. Um, he developed a program to um, be able to promote music basically he would take uh his renderings of big uh, uh commercial songs sell them to tv and movies and they would pay the licensing at a far lesser rate uh he became hugely globally successful because of that universal music group bought that out he'll tell the story about that process of being an upcoming musician and uh um, being able to uh, transition from maybe the stereotype of being a Sunset Strip rocker into a, a wonderful business magnate. So um, she's uh, updated her battery and she's just went back up. And the folks that you did um, did return here, uh, Andrew Cloudwater, it's good to see you here. I'm going to bring Maya back in here now. And uh, she is... Just, I think, getting her camera going here as well. So Maya, uh, and, well, she'll, she'll be here shortly. Hey, she's chatting. Um, not seeing you here yet, Maya, but uh, if you can uh, reconnect to the channel, you'll be right here. Um, she's on her laptop now. Can't get her camera to work. Uh, we'll just keep trying. <laughs> we'll get this going. And maybe while that uh, that phone is charging, here I'll um, I'll just keep you keep you active and you keep working at it, um, folks. Again, go to uh, mayawin.com. You'll be able to find out about all of her up and coming uh, events. She talked about this five week tour that's just going on. She's got a show here in Portland, Oregon tomorrow on uh, on April tenth. It's um, with uh, Dreadlight at Hollow Scene and. Um, yeah, well, she'll be back here shortly. So, um, so it's just you and I and uh, the rest of the, the group while we're uh, we're waiting for Maya to return. Um, <laughs> the dog catcher says her tech struggles are the envy of none. That was very good, uh, guys. If you hear you're here in the chat, how many of you people out here have listened to uh, to that first record? I see that. Um, Isa Martinez, her favorite songs from that Envy of None record, the first one, are Western Sunset and Look Inside. Um, yeah, Western Sunset, beautiful tribute to Neil Peart. So nice uh, nice connection there, Ross. Um, Ian Bennett, again, here, here. He's, she's got this. Um, Ian's birthday is today, so this is kind of fun that we get an opportunity for uh, him to enjoy some of Maya Wynn's tunes while she's um, she's reconnecting here. <clears throat> um, you guys will all be here tomorrow, right? For the Mark Ferrari show. It's the same time, five o'clock Pacific, eight o'clock Eastern. And uh, while uh, while she's prepping and getting things ready, why don't you guys drop in some notes here in the chat about some things that you might want to ask Maya. Maya's, Rob McLean's a big fan. Look at this. Here she is. Maya Wynn, how are you? <laughs> I'm great. I'm on my iPad now. So hello. Oh, nice. Yeah. You know what? That's a cool perspective. I like this one even more. Yeah. Look at this. We've got leopard print. Like we got a different yes. perspective on the artwork. This is a very awesome. cool Airbnb. So good see, stuff, man. Well, <laughs> yes. People, um, people on oh, this Greg Ross too. So Greg is in the chat now. So he, uh, he's staying up late in the East coast. This is nice. Hey, Rob McLean wants to know details about the music video. 
Yes. Okay. So we did it. <laughs> oh my God, my hand looks huge. Um, we did a, a music video in Toronto at in this grody bathroom. What's funny is the bathroom we ended up filming in is the bathroom at the Rush Warehouse. Um, and he was like, Wait a minute. Hold on a sec. <laughs> the Rush Warehouse? There yeah. is such a thing? Yeah. So when Anthem Records shut down, they took all their stuff out of there and put the... Okay. Um, you can a you can send warehouse that. full of like... It's like the, to all their tour gear. Um, so there's like oh. drums and guitars and like amps and, and like all so much gear. Um, private message me that address, okay? Yeah. <laughs> private message me the address. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> all right. So that grody bathroom was inside the Rush Warehouse. This is great. Oh, look, Maya has a producer that's helping like char <laughs> charge her devices. I do. This is what that's what Rockstar looks like. <laughs> that's I like this. Right here at the Four <laughs> Seasons, Maya's got her uh, her producer helping right. connect her device. <laughs> that that yeah, I, the people in the chat are freaking out when they're knowing about uh, about the Rush Warehouse. The I, Rush yeah, Warehouse I, is amazing. It it was like, it was the most amazing experience. <laughs> Hold on, she moved her uh, her device for a second and lost that connection. So hopefully, <laughs> she, she was just telling us how amazing the warehouse was and disappeared her disappeared from it. But um, Maya, if you're there, we'll see if uh, your connection comes back. And uh, oh my goodness, yeah, this is great. Uh, you know, if there's anything, we've learned how to punt and pivot with uh, crazy technology. But and Greg Ross's anthem still exists. Rush box set, box sets galore on the way. Um, yeah, I haven't seen any of the interviews. I don't think at the warehouse. Oh, maybe I have actually with Alex and Getty. This is, I think, that's where they first dis, um, released the uh, the Rush beer, right? So, um, uh, hopefully, you know, we're gonna get Maya back one more time. This is quite enjoyable to me, just because, you know, oh, what she didn't say as we started the podcast, and the reason that we were a few minutes late was that. Um, <laughs> Poor girl. She's just been on the run all the time and she lost her car today. So she was stuck in a parking lot wandering around trying to find where her car was. So um, hopefully now that uh, she's got her car back and she's in her Airbnb, then uh, we'll get plugged in and, and return. Um, Andrew Clowder, you were asking about live gigs. So yes, um, she's going, she's got a show here tomorrow at Holocene. Uh, with Dreadlight at uh, a really cool Portland location. Then she's doing five weeks of tours all across North America. So U.S. and Canada um, starts this month and goes all the way into June. So if you go to mayawin.com, you can find out about those tour dates. She hasn't announced the dates yet, but she said she's going to right away. And um, um, so, yeah, um, Russ, the, the show in Portland to support her new record, I would think that tomorrow her new solo stuff is going to be on display. The Envy of None, well, when she comes back, maybe we'll find out whether or not Envy of None is going to be on the road. Um, McLean, we're still going to get the music video information. Greg Ross, yes, I do appreciate the fact that you're here. It's only nine, but uh, you know, you're all the way in the East Coast. Um, and Aisa Martinez says that uh, the ghosts are guilty. They stole Maya's battery. That could be. That could be. Um, if you believe in ghosts, it seems like uh, they've affected an awful lot of my circumstances lately, too. So we'll find out for you, Rob, whether she'll be in Minneapolis or not. And um, yeah, all, all these good, good, these are great questions. So hopefully she'll come back and we'll get her. And we can ask these last few questions. And then I'm going to have her play another song. Um, I think, uh, you know, she talked about the different treatment that Envy of None did to her, um, the song that she brought to the band. But um, I'd really like to hear some new Envy of None stuff. I wonder if she can do that on her cigar box guitar. That would be cool. <clears throat> but uh, in the meantime, Greg Ross, why don't you tell me about what Envy of None material you can get if you go to manicmerch.com or visionmerch.com. <clears throat> 
Oh, yes. Greg says she'll be in Indianapolis in May. How about Minneapolis? Greg, do you know about uh, any Minneapolis tour dates? We'll find out. And Ross wants to know if there's going to be a tour with the Envy of None Brothers. Yeah, it would seem really difficult to put in all that effort into a record and not want to get out and support it. But, um, yeah, you know, I can tell you this while you guys are waiting. Um, Greg, you'll appreciate the fact that uh, there's a brand new Flock of Seagulls video coming out. I just saw the proofs of it, and we shot um, – we shot a music video over two different dates in uh, England in September and October. And um, it was pretty cool. Those shows, we had the original bass player from a flock of seagulls come and join us on stage for those, but he's not in the music video. Um, there's a song called some dreams. It's a new single from the band and uh, it's kind of cool. Nice live music video showing uh, all of us doing our thing. So that'll be happening soon. Um, I'll make sure that, uh, well, if you want to go to accesskevin.com, you'll find all these videos. But if you go to kevinrankin.com, you can see all the tour dates for Flock. We're going to be at Disney World this weekend. So if you're out playing with your kids, come to Disney. Um, yeah, Greg, okay, yeah, you said, so Minneapolis in May. So Rob, Rob McClain, he can go see her play in a couple of months in uh, Minneapolis. Well, that'd be great. And, um, oh, yeah, so on the Vision Merch site, you can go and get first album, the Envy of None record, autographed copies. So we may as well do that now. Here, why don't I do this? We'll just add this caption into uh, the little Maya Win captions. And you guys can go out and check out visionmerch.com. All right. So yeah, we're we're punting here, folks. Hopefully Maya can come back in and we'll get her back here in a second. Well, she, there she is. Look at this. This is great. Oh awesome. My God, I'm so sorry. You no, you're fun. Me. Today's been one of those days. I lost my car, found my car, lost the internet as we're streaming. My phone died. You've been so patient. <laughs> you know what, man? I, I like if that's the worst stuff that happens to me today, then I'm winning, man. So <laughs> Uh, for you too. I love that Airbnb. Look at the the door back there. Even if it's flipped, Great. relax, chill out, yeah. <laughs> unwind. I know it's full of those like inspirational quotes you find at like most Airbnbs now. It's That's like, good. A whole wall. It's a, like there. That one says good vibes. This one says like live long and prosper or something. <laughs> nice. I dig. Hey, I added something to the captions here. I put the vision merch link up here because Greg Ross is selling autographed Thank copies you, of Envy of None. Yay! So yeah, this, um, you know, so, um, yes. And Maya has a store in vision merch as well. So go to visionmerch.com. You can get Maya win stuff and you can get envy of none stuff. Um, you are right at the beginning telling us about this music video. You were saying <laughs> the coolest thing about the rush warehouse. So let's, yes. let's go back to that. <laughs> yeah. So the rush warehouse is just full of like all of their tour gear and like, it was just amazing to be there. And then, yeah, they have this like, this kind of gross bathroom, although it actually, it was very clean. Um, we kind of had to, to make it more gross for the video. So we you okay. know, threw toilet paper around and, and made it more grody. But it, um, we were sort of like referencing this scene from the Joker. Um, he goes into this bathroom and does this weird sort of interpretive dance. <laughs> so yeah. for the music video, we're kind of referencing that. So I did this like crazy makeup, um, and then did this sort of interpretive dance. And then we also did some stuff in the studio um, with light and shadows and silhouettes and like a lot of body movement and like playing with light and shadows. And I'm really excited about this song. It started as uh, the instrumental that Andy sent me. They had named it Mean and Creepy, uh, but the lyrics are actually very, like what I was inspired to write was, is very, it's sort of about wanting to be a better person but continuing to kind of fall into these destructive habits and and you kind of end up being the villain of your own story um mm. and it's sort of that that uh, internal battle of wanting to be a better person and, and kind of continuing these these cycles and 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 not quite ever getting there um so i, I <laughs> it's there's a heavy. lot of visual metaphor between light and dark and and like you you kind of see this like I don't know, uh, descent into madness. And, and it's like, is she a hero? Is she a villain? Like, 
what is this crazy makeup? What's going on? And it's sort of this like weird dance between both of those, both of those things. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about it. Wow. So was the director and editor sort of part of that storytelling or was this a lot of, uh, cause it sounds out of autobiographical a little bit, right? So <laughs> is this, how much of this did you have input on? I did have a lot of input on this one. Um, and uh, Jaden, who who filmed um, and sort of like we kind of co-directed it together, and like it was just the two of us for the for the filming. Um, the last video that we did for Envy of Done, the Look Inside video, um, yeah, was sort of like a group effort, and and Andy had uh, ideas for that one, and we kind of did a lot of trippy visuals for that one. Um, and but this one, I kind of I had more influence over the the sort of story and and where I wanted to go with it because I. Yeah, this song this song is a little bit more autobiographical, autobiographical. Although I put a lot of myself into the first record too. Like Look Inside, honestly similarly was about like looking inside yourself at the kind of the ugliest parts of your own self and um uh you know trying to it's uh, honestly weirdly sim about very similar things. It's kind of that cycle of like trying to slay those inner demons and and yeah. those dragons inside of yourself that's what look inside was kind of about like ugh, look at look inside yourself and look at that gross to work through um and then i guess this new song is kind of kind of a a next step in that cycle so i'm sure maybe maybe the next album will be like finally getting to the other side of that battle but yeah well do you <laughs> ever i mean like if if there's some stuff that's inherent in all of us uh yeah. You know, I mean, that's maybe it's a lifelong battle, right? And hopefully, you don't make some of the choices that you did, you know, and some because you you talked about, um, you know, some of the challenges you faced were toxic relationships that you were in, or maybe some choices you made that, um, you know, put yourself in a situation that was not healthy. Hopefully, those are the changes, right? You're making fewer of those and getting yeah. past those. I mean, yeah. circumstances. <laughs> sometimes just kick your ass right where they just throw you right back in the same freaking frying pan that you wanted to get out of in the first place exactly. but uh, it's so hard weird. to break cycles i think even like what even when you become aware of a cycle it can be really hard to break and, and hard to to break habits it's the same thing in our brains you know we are creatures yeah. of habits and once you create a groove a groove and a neural pathway in your brain it's like um it goes there automatically without even uh, having to think about it. So cr trying to create new neural pathways and, and new experiences and new habits, it's, it becomes harder and harder the further those grooves go and the deeper they become. So, yeah, you know, changing and growing, it's, it's a really hard thing to do, but people can do it. People can change, people can grow and get better, but it has to be a choice and it has to be something you do every day. And, and you're probably going to fall back into those grooves at some point and then you'll have to find your way back out of it again. But yeah, it is, it's a, it's a constant thing, you know, you find that you recognize them quicker, right? I went over yeah. time, you recognize the pattern of dropping in and you think, Oh yeah, I've, you know, I, I, I know for myself, I might not have recognized some of those things. I wasn't as cognizant to, you know, some choices that I made. Um, and, and I can then at least reflect and react differently because it's it's a little sooner that I've discovered it and I can choose to reframe and re refocus but um, do you feel like your effort in trying to learn all these instruments and sort of because you, know, you talked about being sort of enamored with the challenge and discovery of new min instruments does some of that pursuit come from saying okay this is just another step forward to add progress to my life yeah yeah i mean i think everything everything feels like a step forward at this point you know, like once like you said once you become aware of it and once you become aware of what you where you want to be you know every choice from from learning something new to moving to a new place to making new music and and making choices in your career path and personal life choices it all becomes kind of part of that journey of finding a new groove and and getting out of those old places and yeah i kind of feel like that's where i am now you know finding finding new new places in my life and and new pathways do you have rituals like daily 
I'd like to be the person that has da daily rituals, <laughs> but yeah. not yet. <laughs> I'm trying to be. I, my, I'm trying to become a healthier person. Like you know, waking up earlier in the day, and and I'd love to be a person that does yoga. Like I'm so jealous yeah. of yoga people. You know, <laughs> like, I want right. to be a yoga person so bad. Um, <laughs> I'm just not yet, but someday. <laughs> yeah. Uh I would imagine, you know, you've got, you know, good friends and, and, uh, you know, that are yoga people that would gladly, cause it seems like my friends that are way into yoga are almost evangelists. You know, they try to get me into that space, but Ian loves yoga. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. Ian will. Oh, and that's a uh, beautiful uh, quote. That's, is that Neil Peart? Yeah. My angels and demons at war, which one will lose depends on what I choose. Neil, man, I, I, um, you know, I talked about my son earlier, Caleb. As he became a drummer, you know, I, my influences were, uh, they were different. You know, I respected Neil for sure because he's a cerebral drummer. I had a hard time watching him play because he looked pained. He looked so focused on things that he didn't look like he was enjoying what he did. And mm -hmm. and it, it it bothered me. And I, you know, I, and so... Uh, I told my son, I said, these are the other guys that I chose as influences. And he said, play me their lyrics. And then I realized that was the gift, right? I mean, aside from his brilliance at being a cerebral drummer, his prose was phenomenal, right? He was such mm -hmm. an intelligent writer. And yeah. and I think that's where a lot of the people that are here in the, um, in the chat and the people that really understood, you know, how impactful his writing was. I was just guilty of of letting melody drive a lot of my interest in music. That's how I've always been. M lyrics are the last thing I hear, and it it's a guilty thing. Honestly, I feel embarrassed to say that sometimes because <laughs> I I but I I also get to discover music completely in a different way now. As I get older and lyrics become more important, it's like finding a band all over again, you know, or finding music and and being fascinated by it, but. Sometimes it's inexplicable, though, you know, the, the thing about a song that makes you feel something. Because sometimes it is lyrics and sometimes it is melody and sometimes it's just this inexplicable feeling you get when you listen to a song, when all of those things come together to, to do something. And sometimes it's like the silence in a song that hits you the most, you know, it's like mm. it could be anything. But for me, it's like I, it's, I find it hard to define what it is that I like. I just know when it's something I like, you know, and it's like yeah. this is it's tickling my brain in the right way and it's, and it's yeah. moving me. <laughs> Do you get moved by yeah. music pretty quick? Yeah. Do you know the last song maybe that made you, brought you to tears? Yes, actually I was, I just went to a concert. Um, hey Maya, your internet just dropped for a second so i lost you oh, for a second you said you, you just went to now. a concert yep you're back i did <laughs> okay, good. i just i'm so sorry the internet here is a bit funny um but i i just went to a concert a couple days ago and it's um victoria canal and i've been listening to her music uh all last year and it's been helping me through so much and, and it just goes straight to my heart um but the the opener as well lucy clearwater um I didn't know her music as much and I was standing there listening to it for the first time live and she was pitch perfect, just like mm. a perfect performance. And like, I was bawling. I was embarrassed oh. at how much I was crying and I was standing there like in the front oh. row, just bawling my eyes out. But it was just, I don't know, something about it. It was just perfect. And it hit my heart so painfully hard and i just like oh. i lost it but it was so cathartic it was beautiful yeah. and like she was just amazing and victoria as well and i've been listening to her music for like the last year and, and crying to it too so it's oh. it just one of those concerts where it was just like you don't need earplugs you know this is like a very stripped down uh kind of concert and you're just it's super intimate and like you're, you're there to cry for sure. I was not the only person crying, but it was just, it oh. was such a beautiful experience. And I just think, you know, I feel so lucky to get to experience music like that. And um, I don't know. What about you? What's the last song that, that really hit you? Um, you know what? I, uh, I'm a sucker. 
I'm a sucker for ballads. There's a Canadian band actually that has me so hooked. I'm so embarrassed by my obsession with this band. The last couple of years, I got so into this band that I flew to Toronto to go see him. I flew to Denver to go see him. I they rarely played in the U.S. And then when they finally did just tour in the U.S., I was out on tour, and so they played Portland, and I wasn't there. Oh. And I had friends that showed up with my picture in their meet and greets so that I could be there with them. <laughs> it's so bad. But yeah, Andrew Cloweter knows. Big Wreck is the band. Ian Thornley mm-hmm. is the singer. And uh, I don't know if you're hip to them at all, but they, I'm going to check one them the, out after this. There's a song called Haunted that uh, came out. Uh, they, they've they been releasing uh, sets of three EPs as a release for the records. And um, during the pandemic, they came out with three different versions of this their sevens album came out with part one, part two, part three. Um, this song haunted has for me that what moves me in a lot of bands is the chord progression in a bridge. When they have a phenomenal bridge, it gets me so much. And there's, there's something about this, this guy's voice and, uh, in his songwriting that I'm an evangelist. I will just sing this guy's praises because the music moves me so much. And, you know, he's a virtuosic player. He's a, one of the most ridiculous guitar players I've ever heard in my life. The band is so good. Technically, they're amazing. The So they have all the stuff for musos to get into the, the, the technicality they're playing, but the breath, right? When the songs have space, and you talked about that, uh, being able mm-hmm. to feel space. I was on a hike today with my dog and I ran into this guy that I'd never met before. And he saw that I have a drum shirt on and he said, Oh, drummer as well. And and he said, uh, have you ever heard this? He instantly went into something to evangelize. And he, he was telling me about something that moved him. And it was a Tom Waits song. And he said, mm-hmm. listen to the first 16 bars of drums. And it was just like that tempo and there was nothing but space in it and this guy he welled up and then Aww. wanted to hug me because the music moved him so much i had never met this dude he's a new yorker <laughs> from brooklyn and i was like man what a gift right to be able to feel music yeah. like that right it's so beautiful i i um i think especially in a time where it's difficult to connect emotionally i think we're so disconnected right now because of the internet because of how our society is at the moment it's so hard to have those kinds of genuine connections that like being able to connect with a stranger on the street through a song you know or a beat is just such a yeah it's such a special thing and so yeah i'm really glad you had that moment (laughs) with with your stranger from brooklyn yeah my son was with me, right? And my son has had enough of the disbar- like the um, the disconnect, right? I mean, right now yeah. our country is in disarray. The world is really struggling with a lot of stuff. Um, you know, the political disconnect is is tough. And my son, he's like, I've had enough. He's moving to Thailand in two weeks. He just uh, he he yeah he picked it out. I went to Thailand a couple years ago. I fell in love with that kind of energy. You know, the, the, the Buddhist foundation that's there is about unconditional kindness and love. And I met tons of strangers that welcomed me into their life that were so gracious that um, were embracing me without having known me at all. And my son's not been there, but I hope he finds that. I hope he finds that that connection happens with people when they can look past dividing lines, right? They look and look, look past mm-hmm. political things and, you know, racial things and and all that stuff i mean i hate to sound so hippie but i mean we need that you know we need (laughs) these kind of connections so badly like oh no greg ross says andy kern managed big rack when he was at anthem oh full circle that's great yeah Yeah, andy's somebody i need to have on the show i i you know what i was thinking about actually reaching out to andy on because i wanted him to jump in and surprise you on this podcast because i thought it'd be fun (laughs) To have, so but he- you know, okay. I was playing at a show uh, in St. Louis. I, I opened for Rush Fest uh, about a week ago, 
Oh and they God. were going to surprise me with Andy at the Rush Fest. I don't know if really? it's so funny that people keep trying to surprise me with Andy. <laughs> <laughs> did he not show at Rush Fest? No, for you? he was busy, so he couldn't come. But he did tell me that that people had asked him to come, and they told uh, me to. But that's that's so funny. I, I'm just going to be haunted by a surprise Andy visits for the right? rest of my life. <laughs> like, but it's never going to surprise you if he does show up now because it's you know I, I, I know. ruined it. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, during our chat, in our breaks, you know, we had our little technical breaks, which is great because people came up with <laughs> yeah. all these questions. Rob wants to know about your new movie, Powder Pup. <laughs> I am in a movie. Um, so it's actually technically being distributed by Lionsgate, which is very exciting. But it was a very wow. small budget kind of indie film. Um, and we filmed it in Montana. And it's a family family movie about a snowboarding dog, which is very cute. Um, the dog does actually snowboard. His name is Walter, the dog. Um, and and uh, he's very good at snowboarding and he genuinely loves to do it. Um, it's all he wanted to do while we were filming. Um, but I play one of the lead characters in that and um, it's very fun to film. I have a stunt double that made me look really cool. Um, he was like a six foot tall guy with a beard. Um, who could do flips <laughs> on the snowboard. So <laughs> oh it made God. me look I really cool. <laughs> And a stat, you know, like you know, you're statuesque, but you know, six <laughs> six plus with the beard. That's a little, you know, that's you that's, would think that, you you'd be able to spot movie. it, but I had like we had the the whole like face covering, goggles, helmet, you know, so you can't really tell. <laughs> okay, are you pretty good on the board though? Uh, I. <laughs> I can make it down the hill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. No flips. You're not doing any no kind flips. of. Uh, you know, no flips. Like, uh, I are did you a also skier a or a boarder? Uh, double. Uh, I, I do snowboard. I, I started snowboarding when I was like 10. Um, I think I believed I was better at snowboarding than I actually am. I don't know. Maybe it's just okay. like I got older and like, you know, as you get older, everything becomes scarier and you're like way more aware of your own mortality as an adult. Sure. <laughs> but yeah. Snowboarding scares me now. When I was younger, yeah. I like I had this memory of like, oh, yeah, I did a couple snowboarding lessons. I used to do it um, in the winters growing up. Like, I'll be fine. I applied for this this role. And then I was like, I should probably get back on the mountain, you know, and just make sure I'm like good to go. And then I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> this is terrifying. <laughs> what have I done? What did I sign up for? But I, did they I ask you to do your stunts first? What? <laughs> did they ask when you first applied for that and you were auditioning? Or I mean, is that did, did you go through an audition process? I did. I went through an audition process, um, but I'm also friends with the director, and uh, okay. I had done some songs for a couple of his past films, and so we had been in talks about uh, me being in one of his films, and he's like, "I have a role for you. I'd love for you to read for it." So I still auditioned for it. Um, and thankfully they liked my audition. Um, and then they did ask if I could snowboard and I was like, yeah, I can snowboard. Of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Flips. No problem. I got it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They didn't ask if I could do flips. Thankfully they were already prepared for like stunt doubles and everything. So I was fine. I just did like really basic stuff, like, you know, going into the scene and I bought like a brand new snowboard and it was waxed. And so I kind of, like screwed myself over because for these scenes we had to snowboard into the shot and like stop in a certain spot and no matter what I did this board would not stop I could be on flat oh, yeah. ground and it would slide because it was, <laughs> it, was it was waxed and so smooth and like I felt like light as a feather and I would try to stop and like I would slowly glide out of frame no matter oh, what I God. did um <laughs> we had to have like little things off frame to get me to stop but it was pretty funny I, I did a, I did a good job at, with my very basic snowboarding stuff. There's only a few, I'm sure, outtakes of me completely biffing it off camera. But thankfully, it was usually off camera. <laughs> I, I got past the camera and then fell. So those would yeah. be good, yeah, for for yeah for the extras on uh, when it goes to Netflix, right? We can watch the uh, the, yeah. <laughs> the, the, all all of your wipeouts. Yeah, it's Rob, on Amazon Rob... Prime. And oh, it is I'm, okay. Yeah, I'm also in. Oh. Uh, a couple of Netflix shows, um, Metal Lords. I am, but I have a very a small minute. role in Metal Lords on Netflix um, as a really one of the bands in the Battle of the Bands scene. If you you'll see me for two seconds. Um, if you okay. blink, you'll miss it. Um, but that was also very fun. So 
Yeah. <laughs> that's, oh, that's great. I, you know, dear friend of mine, Glenn was, uh, he was coaching the drummer in the show on how to play. And he's my buddy's Alice Cooper's drummer. So he had to take a little bit of time in between like their breaks during the pandemic to teach that kid how to play drums for metal Lords. So oh. but, uh, <laughs> that's great. Small world. <laughs> it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Metal Lords. Yes. The one that was shot mm-hmm. around Portland. Exactly. Yeah. That, you know, dog catchers asking this. So, um, the, um, uh, Rob, again, Rob McLean says, your life is so interesting, Maya. So when are you going to put out a book? <laughs> I um, would honestly love to put out a book sometime. I've been thinking about it. I've had a crazy, weird life, you know, like I, yeah. even just in my personal life, like I left home when I was 16 and like, I went through a lot of stuff and like, I, I just feel like I don't have the wisdom to write a book yet. Like I want to start writing it, but like, yeah. I'll probably finish it, you know, years down the line <laughs> once i've do figured journal? out life's great questions <laughs> do you journal i do journal I, I need to be journaling okay. more i do i've been doing video diaries more because okay. i feel like yeah. i can just spout a bunch of nonsense into a camera and call it good <laughs> yeah man i um you know i mentioned to you this my, my, my dad passed away about a week and a half ago so i've been yeah. with him the last couple months in montana and I've been finding, I found these treasure troves of journals. I cannot believe the stuff that he kept. And when, like one of my first real cool memories of, of childhood was this trip that we took from Montana to go deep sea fishing in Oregon. And Aww. I remember the trip so vividly, but what I didn't know was that he had the captain of the ship send pictures because we didn't have a camera on the sh- on the boat this is way back and like you know pre what like long before you were ever conceived and, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah but he had the director there or the captain of the ship send all these photos but then my dad had made a journal of every element of that trip he sketched photos my dad's an artist he sketched these photos of all the nefarious characters on the boat you know like jim the bullshitter and uh, <laughs> all, most of them look kind of like db cooper you know or these old like villains but i uh I, it astounded me that those journals were even there and i look at i found you know just so much stuff that way and i realized how important it is most people don't write like handwrite anymore you know yeah. and uh and there really is a, a, a gift in finding something that's that tangible piece you know that um uh you know as a, a mark in history you talked about leaving at 16 yeah. you don't leave home at 16 without a whole series of circumstances that are going to affect your life for the rest of your life you know yeah. forever <laughs> yeah uh, and and I would imagine a lot of people could relate to some of those things too. So, you know, part of the gift is, is documenting your, and chron- like uh, chronicling your history. But yeah. a lot of it, I would imagine would be cathartic too for people that could relate to, you know, some of, of those circumstances. Yeah, man. I love that story about, about your dad though, in that journal, like I can only imagine how that felt finding that and getting to relive <laughs> that through his drawings and, and his words and, and, how cathartic that was for you to to have that connection through time there's something like you said it's it's more than just a quick photo on the phone like we are probably yeah. drowning in in selfies and we will be for eons to come yeah but but something about a handwritten you know experience and and drawings and there's something so much more personal and and meaningful with that it's really beautiful yeah yeah Thank you. I, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, Ross Quinzer says, uh, Maya's effing life. You know, Getty's been out on tour, right? <laughs> Promoting his book right mm-hmm. now. So yeah. did you get a, have you gotten a copy? I haven't gotten a copy yet. I, that's, okay. It's been on my, my, my to read list is very long and I look at it and I feel very disappointed in myself. <laughs> oh, well, there's only, there are only so many hours in the day, you know, yeah. and yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, my, I sent my boy to go to see Getty, you know, at the book signing and the, the release in Denver and, and he brought his copy back. He's staging his here, stuff here while he moves to Thailand. And so I saw the book setting out. I thought I got to peek at it. Cause I heard there's some amazing revelations in there, but uh, yeah. Rob McLean says it's a great read. Of yeah. course, people in the chat here, they've all read it, you know, so they all know <laughs> that, uh, yeah. But, uh, but um, 
I um I think the next time that we get the chance, you know, when we get to you know reconnect after a little bit of time, um, what do you foresee changes? I mean, you you just relocated to California, and you talked about doing some reflection on changing patterns and doing some work on yourself. So where do you see yourself, say, a year from now? Where do you want to be? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I'm releasing my album. Um, I'm going to have physical copies available on this tour, and I'll be releasing singles along the tour digitally. Um, so I'll have my album out, which I think will feel really nice um, to finally... Uh, you know, it's been a long time coming. Yeah. And uh, people have been waiting for it. I've been waiting to release this thing. So I'm very excited to finally be on that last leg of release for it. So um, I think I'll feel really, uh, really relieved to have that out and to be able to focus on the next um, chapter of music. I hope that I am even more grounded in my sense of self. I hope I'm, uh, I want to be touring more and, and traveling more and really just, um, getting into that headspace where I'm, I'm adventuring. And um, I don't know, I, I hope that wherever I am, I am, yeah, I feel independent and happy, at least happy is such a, a complicated term, right? right? But I hope yeah. that I am, I'm content and mm. um, grounded in myself and that I am doing things that I enjoy um, and that I'm surrounded by people that I, that I love, you know, I hope that that's, yeah. that's where I am, uh, whatever it looks like. Cause it's so unpredictable. You never really know. But, sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, content is one thing, you know, surrounding yourself with people you love too. That's a great one. I mean, the people that I've met that know you, you know, like instantly just they're enamored with your personality and your, your, your energy. You've got great, great energy. So uh, I'm glad you'll be touring because that just means that that many more people are going to be exposed to the magic of my own, you know, Yay. <laughs> so that, um, uh, so for folks that didn't get this pitch, I'm just doing it again, man. People should know that tomorrow, April 10th, Wednesday at Holocene, Maya Wynn's going to be playing with Dreadlight. Uh, do you know what time your set is? Uh, I believe, uh, doors are at seven and okay. I think Show I start eight. at eight. That um, sounds excellent. Yeah. yeah. That means that I can get there. I have a podcast tomorrow with Mark Ferrari, but Ooh. I can finish it up and head to Holocene, which is a fantastic yes, thing. So, oh, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm bringing a Kebby metal hug your way. Okay. Yes, please. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, um, it'll be wonderful to hear your music in person. Mm. I, I know that you've been holding on to this phone or this device to, um, <laughs> To, uh, to, like, to try and balance it. No, well, but I, and so I, I knew that holding on to it might make it really difficult for you maybe to play us out, but are you able to play a, a song or is it, is it impossible think, to do? Let me try it. Let me try it here. I think if I start okay. here, I can do this. Oh, yes. Yeah, there we go. There we go. A little strange angle, but... Before you start, let me just say, Rob McLean just asked about when you're in Minneapolis and... Uh, up above, Greg Ross said that you're there in May. You've got a yes. show in May. So, is this uh, your five week tour? Is that what what that yes. that's part of? Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So, Rob McLean, go to go to mywin.com, and I think she'll announce those dates shortly. Um, and uh, Ross just said, doors at seven tomorrow at Holocene, fourteen bucks at the door. Oh, you guys so, are the best. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, man. We're gonna, let's let's suck her up. Thank you for being let's, my brain. <laughs> let's sell it out, man. All right, Rob, he said, what date? You're in New York. Rob, you're just going to have to wait unless Maya knows her dates off. Like, uh, but Oh, I, I think, think actually have... I'm in New York on June 1st, I think. If you look, I haven't announced these dates yet. I will be very soon. Um, but okay. Pratik Kuhad here, I can, it's P-R-A-T-E-E-K. Um, and that's who I'm opening for. And he has all of the dates listed on his website. Awesome. But I will be officially announcing it very soon. Um, and yeah, I think it's June 1st in New York City. And these are going to be really beautiful theaters, like 600 to um, 2,500 seat Good. theaters. As you, like, should, 
Yeah. As you I'm so deserve. <laughs> awesome. And then Boston on uh, May 31st. Thanks, Ian Bennett. Yeah, this thank is you. great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, you guys awesome. are great. <laughs> All right, so uh, you know what? We'll do this for uh, for Ian just because it's your birthday today. So Ian, we'll dedicate this uh, last piece to you, if that's all right. Uh, and, <laughs> yes, this um, is for you, but it's not about you. This is like my my song about bad people, but like it's the only <laughs> other one that I <laughs> I'm prepared to play. But Ian, you're the best, and happy birthday! And you are the opposite of this. You're a great person. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Here's my win. <laughs> Shows you a monster inside his hands Claims that he's cleansing the sins of man With his righteous indignation He holds a lifeline just out of reach Tells you to beg for it down on your knees It's a white lie and you'll fall for a crumble like sand Eaten out of the palm of his hand A discord part of his blood That you knew not to worship False gods He shows you a pathway, a promise of light Closes the doorway, leaves you behind self profit He'll call the masses, blood on his knife You'll be the scapegoat, no one inside Yeah, wow, that is awesome. That. <laughs> we heard it perfectly. Yeah, it actually sounded Yay. even more clear than before. That was Yay. so great. Man, that was you've uh, you got some chops, girl. That's beautiful. <laughs> it's, yeah. Imagine that with some distortion. I don't have my distortion pedal with me, but you know, a little bit of grit, and I've got my foot percussion going. Get a nice like four in the floor beat in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The stomp. I can yeah, totally see exactly. that. With that oh man. <laughs> What a gift. You really are radiant, uh, and uh, you were exactly what I needed. Selfishly, man, I was just excited <laughs> to get to hear your stuff, and uh, I'm proud of you. It's great to see all the things that are happening your way. You totally deserve it. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much for having here. me and being uh, so patient with all of my technical difficulties and everything that's gone on today. Oh, maybe one of your uh, your financiers, your your um, your fans can go out and buy you an air tag so you can have for your keys in your car. <laughs> yes. get, we can look. Yes. Like, like, <laughs> Thank you. I would love that. Yeah. It would, com uh, combine me with like all of my brilliant fans and 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 maybe I'll like be a functional person. <laughs> Uh, well, you know what, man, you got a lot going on, right? So you shouldn't be expected to remember everything. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure one of your fans would love to be, you know, your uh, your assistant or, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, publicist and, you know. Yes. Can I it's hire hard to be an artist to be and do it all. Brain, please? <laughs> yeah. There's just, there are only so many hours in the day and places yeah. to be, and you know. So, um, man, I, uh, I want to thank... First of all, let's thank all the people that were here. I didn't, uh, I wasn't even responding to the chats on Instagram, and I'm sorry about that. They don't show up in the um, the live feed here, but so many of you guys, Josh Thompson and Lizzie Graybeard and the Precious Brittany and uh, Reg Atwood, 
man, there are so many people. There are hundreds of hundreds of people there that uh, Jennifer Batten. Thank you, Jennifer, for being here. And uh, um, so all of you guys, uh, Debbie Orth. Oh my gosh, I I'm sorry I missed you guys. I was too caught up in our conversation to to see you guys on Instagram. So uh, let's do this, you and I. I'm gonna I'll do a little Facebook Live tomorrow, and I'll throw it up here on the Access Live um, All Access Live channel to you from your show tomorrow night. Oh, that I can't would be wait great. to see you. And um, and I'll make sure that uh, as you're announcing your dates with Pratik, that I will get them on your uh, the show notes for this show. So Thank folks, you. go to accesskevin.com and you can see this interview in entirety with all the details for Maya's upcoming shows. Get out there, buy the new Envy None record, buy the Maya Win record, and um, and then maybe when I have Andy on the show, I can have you jump on and surprise him. Yes. Why don't we do that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. I, I don't have the in with um, with Alex, so I can't do that. But yeah. <laughs> one one thing I do know of everybody that I've talked to that knows Alex said he's such a prankster and one of the funniest guys that people like. It's funny to hear about how hilarious he is, right? Like you know, because that, that 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 band for being such a cerebral you know band uh, and very serious lyric lyric content uh mm -hmm. they're funny they really didn't take themselves seriously and it was, it's fun to hear about that so yeah. hopefully alex has been a, a good source of comedic you know uh, absolutely inspiration for you too <laughs> so but uh yeah man well my win thank you so much girl you're wonderful and uh thank and you. all of you guys thank you for being here Tomorrow night, five o'clock, I'll be here with Mark Ferrari. Lots of good stories there. And then join me afterward. We'll go and watch Maya play a little bit of show live. Yay, All right, you guys, you take so care. Much for having me. Don't get lost tomorrow before your show, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no promises, but I'll try. <laughs> right on. All right, sister. Take care. Thanks.